Well, good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight for the Lessons of Vietnam show, as always. Uh, sorry about our last show. It, uh, it's a two-man show here, and uh, uh, if one of us is out, then the other one's out. So uh, sorry about that, but we'll make it up for you. Uh, as you can see on the, on the screen there, uh, Lessons of Vietnam show, telling the story of the of Vietnam War and the men and women who served the United States military. We're trying to dispel the myths and half-truths. I am your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 67 and 68. And let's see, two, uh, night. Anyway, I've been back three times. I don't remember the dates now. Uh, we're broadcast courtesy of Nissan Communications in the Worldwide Studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, for you having any comments or suggestions after the show, contact me at DixonBill80 at Yahoo.com. But even better now, during the show, I want you to call in on 919-518-9773. Or even better, go to Skype, Computers 2K Voice, as you see right there on the screen, and uh, make comments and so forth. Uh, put in your two cents worth about the Vietnam War and what we're going to be talking about. We do have a uh, a particular subject tonight. Uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight and discussing is the uh, aircraft used in the Vietnam War and their losses. But before we get started on the show, I want to uh, uh, go over this because it's very important. If you are a veteran, you know a veteran, or you yourself are a veteran, and you uh, having some uh, a crisis. Uh, feeling some pr extra pressure there, please call 1-800-273-8255, press 1, and talk to the people there. There's someone there wanting to talk to you. Uh, there's a lot of Vietnam vets now have been working and, and retiring. Uh, you know, some of us are getting a little older, uh, retiring and so forth. And now we've got more time on our hands and some of the things of the Vietnam War is coming back. Uh, I've been told that the, uh, the 22 uh, average veterans a day who commit suicide in the United States, a lot of them are Vietnam vets now because those nightmares and some come back and come forth. There's about five in the state of North Carolina. Now, tonight's show will be, as I mentioned, the aircraft and their losses. Uh, some of the airplanes I've never seen, some of them I or heard of, for that matter. And uh, there was uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight is something I didn't even know existed back during the Vietnam War. So again, you saw the Skype. The telephone number is nine one nine five one eight nine seven seven three, and computers two K voice. Now let's get started in the show. Uh, United States fixed wing aircraft, what we'll be talking about first, is loss of the Vietnam War from 1962 to 1973. I know the war went on before that, before that and after that, but this is the period we're going to be talking about. During the American Vietnam War, thousands of U.S. aircraft were lost to any aircraft or AAA, any aircraft artillery or SAMs, which is a service to air missiles, and MiGs, which was the uh, Russian and Chinese uh, fighter jets the North Vietnamese fighter interceptor aircraft. Most of these losses by the U.S. fixed-wing aircraft in combat was from AA, anti-aircraft artillery. Uh, although the altogether United States military lost during the war in Vietnam almost 10,000 fixed-wing aircraft, and, and it says helicopters there, and I didn't even catch that, but if it's a fixed-wing, it can't be a helicopter. But I guess all of it together, fixed-wing and helicopters, they lost uh, almost 10,000. So that's a lot of airplanes. During the Vietnam War, thousands of U.S. aircraft were lost to anti aircraft artillery, surface to air missiles, and fighter interceptors, MiGs. The Royal Australian Air Force also flew combat and airlift missions in South Vietnam, as the Republic of uh, Vietnam. Among fixed wing aircraft, more F 4 Phantoms were lost than any other type in service with, with any nation. There were 110 types of aircraft used in the Vietnam War. I can tell you I am not going to cover all 110 tonight. I'm going to cover uh, a bunch of them, but not 110. Uh, I don't want all of them worried yet, but uh, still doing some research. The United States lost 578 UAVs. Now, what is a UAV? Unmanned 
aviation vehicle. Over Vietnam, they lost 544, and over China, they lost 24. In total, the United States military lost almost 10,000 aircraft, helicopters, and UAVs, 3,744 airplanes, 5,607 helicopters, and 578 UAVs. The Republic of Vietnam lost 1,018 aircraft and helicopters from January 1964 to September 1973. 877 Republic of Vietnam aircraft were captured at War's End, which was 1975. Of the 2,750 aircraft and helicopters were freed by uh, South Vietnam, only 308 survived. 240 flew to Thailand or U.S. warships, and 68 returned to the United States. The United States, along with South Vietnam, lost about 12,500 aircraft and helicopters. North Vietnam lost 150 to 200 aircraft and helicopters. The uh, reason they didn't lose so many is because they very seldom ever left North Vietnam. In fact, I don't think they ever did. Okay, let's see what we're going to start off with. We're going to start off with the, fan, uh, the, former, uh, the fan F-4 Phantom. Of all the fixed-wing aircraft lost, there were more F-4 Phantoms than any other type of fixed-wing aircraft in service in the Vietnam War. The McDonnell two-place twin-jet all-weather F-4 Phantom II with top speeds more than twice as, uh, that of Sam was one of the most versatile fighters ever built. It served in the first line of more Western Air Forces than any other jet, so it wasn't just used in Vietnam. Loss of the F-4 Phantom flown by the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marines were 533 in combat, 156 in non-combat. Now, let's talk about the non-combat. Non-combat could be that uh, the uh, engine went out. It could be that it was sitting uh, at the uh, particular air base that it was sitting at, and mortar rounds hit it, or the sappers came in and blew it up. There's all kinds of things that um, uh, can be the uh, non-combat. Uh, there's stories I'm going to be telling you of airplanes who bump into each other. Sometimes the air kind of gets kind of full, uh, everybody moving along and so forth. So they have a tendency, some, they have, you know, wrecked just like anybody else. The next one we're going to be talking about is the 01 Bird Dog flown by U.S. Air Force, Army, and Marines. Uh, looks just about like this little Cessna that you see out there uh, at your local uh, 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 municipal airports. In both the United States Army and United States Marine Corps inventories, Initially designated as OE-1s in the Marine Corps until all U.S. military aircraft designations were standardized in 1962. During the Vietnam War, the Bird Dog was used primarily for reconnaissance, target acquisitions, artillery adjustments, radio relays, convoy escorts, and the forward air control of tactical aircraft to include bombers operating in a tactical role. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Ron Fitzsimmons, who I've uh, been no knowing for a long, long time, he flew bird dogs. Uh, their basic job was to fly low and get shot at. When they got shot at, they could say, oh, there's the bad guys, and they could call in artillery strikes or, or the jets or whatever. Uh, losses of the 01 bird dog were 426 in combat and 50 in non-combat. That's a lot of bird dogs, 426. The F-105 Thunder Chief. Boy, look at all those uh, bombs under there. Entered in service in 1958, the F-105, due its high speed and superior low altitude performance, was deployed to Southeast Asia in 1964. A lot of these were cut uh, early on. From 1965 onward, the F-105s flew the bulk of the U.S. Air Force's strike missions in Vietnam, as well as frequently conducted wild weasel which is suppression of enemy air defense missions. That was mean they would go into North Vietnam and uh, and try to clear out the uh, SAMs and so forth before the uh, the big guys come in. Losses were 330 in combat and 62 in non-combat. Another one here is the A-4 Skyhawk, which was flown by the United States Navy and United States Marine Corps. Skyhawk were the U.S. Navy's primary light attack aircraft used over North Vietnam during the early years of the Vietnam War. 
They carried out some of the first airstrikes by the U.S. during the conflict, and a Marine Skyhawk is believed to have dropped the last American bomb on the country. Notable aviators who flew the Skyhawk included Lieutenant Commander Alvarez, who was the second held longest held prisoner of war in uh, Vietnam at Hanoi Hilton, uh, a guy by the name of uh, John McCain, and Commander James Stockdale. Uh, Commander James Stockdale, uh, some of you may have remembered him from when he was going to be put on TV while he was a prisoner. He posted a stool, beat his face up so much they couldn't put him on. Uh, also, another story was that he actually was a spy and was sending messages back home uh, to the Pentagon uh, while he was a prisoner there in Hanoi Hilton. Um uh, on 1 May 1967, a A4C Skyhawk piloted by Lieutenant Commander Theodore R. Swartz shot down a North Vietnamese Air Force MiG-17 as the Skyhawk's only air-to-air victory of the Vietnam War. Their losses, combat were 276, non-combat 87. The F-100 Super Saber, that's pretty. The F-100s were the longest-serving U.S. jet fighter bomber to fight in the Vietnam War. Serving as MiG combat air patrol escorts for F-105 Thunder Chiefs over North Vietnam and then relegated to close air support and ground attacks within South Vietnam. On 18 August 1964, the first F-100 shot down by ground fire, piloted by First Lieutenant Colin A. Clark. Clark ejected and survived. Losses was 198 in combat and 45 in non-combat. The A-1 Sky Raider. See how the wings fold up. Uh, The United States Air Force and the United States Navy uh, flew these primarily. Sky Raiders participated in the first U.S. naval strike against North Vietnam on the 5th of August, 1964, in response to the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Striking against fuel depots in Vin, with one Sky Raider damaged by any aircraft and a second shot down, killing its pilot. During the war, U.S. Navy Sky Raiders shot down two North Vietnamese MiGs, jet fighters, one on June 20th of June 1965 by Lieutenant Clinton B. Johnson and Lieutenant Junior Grade Charles W. Hartman III, and one on 9 October 1966 by Lieutenant uh, Junior Grade. Uh, William T. Patton using their uh, using their cannons. This was the first gun kill of the Vietnam War while on his very first mission. Navy pilot Lieutenant Junior Greg Dieter Dingler took damage to his A-1H over Vietnam on 1 February 1966 and crash landed in Laos. And they made a movie about uh, Dieter Dingler and his crash and how he escaped and so forth. Uh, but I tell you what, flying a plane like that, fighting against a jet, and they shot down two. Those were uh, outstanding pilots. The O2 Skymaster. That's a strange looking airplane, isn't it? Uh, especially in the, up there. Uh, the O2 Skymaster, also known as the Oscar Deuce or the Duck, is a military version of the Cessna 337 Super Skymaster. Utilized as an observation in forward air control aircraft. Now, when we talk about forward air control, uh, that means that uh, they were out to where the bad guys were and there was a fighting going on, a firefight or whatever. Uh, they would fly over, find the enemy and so forth, and call in uh, either artillery or the ships uh, to bombard or other airplanes. The U.S. Air Force commissioned Cessna to build a military variant to replace the O-1 Bird Dog in 1966. During the Vietnam War, the Sky Master was intended to be replaced in the forward air control mission by the OV-10 Bronco, but the O-2A maintained a night mission role after the OV-10's introduction due to the OV-10's high level of cockpit illumination, rendering night reconnaissance impractical. Uh, that, you know, Basically, the the interior lights were too bright. You know, cars today, you dim your interior lights, and I guess nobody thought about that. Uh, Losses in combat was 82, non-combat 22, uh, but it was too bright, and you couldn't see uh, at night, and they could see you real well. 
So that's why it wasn't used uh, uh, like it was always intended. The A-6 intruder. The A-6 became both the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps' principal medium and all-weather night attack aircraft from the mid-60s through the 1990s. The A-6 intruder's first action against action during the Vietnam War, it was used extensively against targets in Vietnam. The aircraft's long range and heavy payload, 18,000 pounds, coupled with its ability to fly in all weather, made it invaluable during the war. However, its typical mission profile of flying low to deliver its payload, payload, excuse me, that can't, can't pronounce that, made it especially vulnerable to any aircraft fire. So they were tough, but they had to fly low, and when you're flying low, uh, you're a good target, either an air, aircraft, uh, any aircraft, but so is a, a, a Viet Cong or a North Vietnamese soldier on the ground with a rifle. Uh, losses were 78 in combat, 11 in non-combat. Okay. F-4, F-8 Crusader, United States Navy and U.S. Marine Corps. As you can see, all those missiles and rockets on the side of that thing, that's awesome looking, isn't it? A single engine, supersonic, carrier-based, Air superiority jet aircraft. The F 8 served principally in the Vietnam War. In the beginning, the Crusader was the best dogfighter the United States had against the nimble North Vietnamese MiGs. As aero combat ensued over North Vietnam from 1965 to 1968, the F 8 Crusader was a key ingredient to the success. The Crusader, also known as a bomb truck in war, with both ship-based U.S. Navy units and land-based United States Marine Corps squadrons attacking communist forces in both North and South Vietnam. The United States Marine Corps Crusaders flew only in the South, while U.S. Navy Crusaders flew only from small Essex-class carriers. Marine Crusaders also operated in close air support missions. The F-8 was Crusader, uh, lost 76 in combat, 71 in non-combat, almost 50-50 there. OV-1 Mohawk, Army. That's also another strange-looking uh, aircraft, but it sounds like a good one here. Uh, in June 1956, the Army issued specifications which called for the development and procurement of a two-seat twin turboprop aircraft designed to operate from small, unimproved fields under all weather conditions it would be faster with greater firepower and heavier armor than the bird dog the mohawk's mission would include observation artillery spotting air control emergency resupply naval target spotting liaison and radiological monitoring the radar image capability of the Mohawk was to prove a significant advance in both peace and war. This is where it really gets strange here. The radar could look through foliage and map terrain, presenting the observer with a film image of the earth below only minutes after the area was scanned. In military operations, the image was split in two parts, one showing fixed terrain features, the other spouting, spotting moving targets. It could see down through the trees. It was also used to be used in, in on short runways, sometimes out in the dirt and so forth. Uh, so losses were 65. The A-7D Corsair, United States Air Force and United States Navy. The A-7 Corsair II single-seat attack aircraft was originally designed as a replacement for the United States Navy's Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. After modifications, the installation of an improved turbofan engine in an M61 Vulcan multi-barrel 20-millimeter cannon, the A7D was also adopted by the Air Force in 1968. The A7D proved to be a reliable single-seat close air support aircraft, innovative in being the first aircraft to use a modern heads-up display providing detailed information on dive angles, airspeed, altitude, drift, and weapons guidance. A-7's advanced integrated navigation system, projected map display system, showed the aircraft's exact location on two different map scales. Serving in Southeast Asia, the A-7D proved itself to be an excellent close air support aircraft. Now, what it's talking about is uh, close support. If you were on the ground and you were uh, getting shot at, uh, they could come in and give you and, and help give you some relief and so forth. Uh, 
they were coming in low and slow and fast and could pinpoint the enemy and uh, so forth. Our losses were 59 in combat, 47 in non-combat. The C-130 Hercules, United States Air Force, United States Marine Corps. The C-130 Hercules primarily performed the tactical portion of the airlift mission. And you saw those all over Vietnam. The aircraft can operate from rough dirt strips and is the prime transport for airdropping troops and equipment into hostile areas. Using its rear loading ramp and a door, the C-130 can accommodate a wide variety of oversized cargo, including everything from utility helicopters and six-wheel armored vehicles to standard palletized cargo and military personnel. In an aerial delivery role, it can airdrop loads up to 42,000 pounds or use its high-flotation landing gear to land and deliver cargo on rough dirt strips. In 1964, C-130 flew missions over the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos supporting the United States Air, Air Force strike aircraft. In April 1965, the mission was expanded to North Vietnam where C-130 crews led formations of B-57 bombers on night reconnaissance strike missions against communist supply routes leading to South Vietnam. Another little known C-130 mission was Operation Commando Scarf, which involved delivery of chemicals into sections of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos that were designed to produce mud and landslides in hopes of making the truck routes impassable. On another show, we talked about how they would come in and would drop in soap suds, trying to make it so the Ho Chi Minh so slicky that they couldn't uh, walk on it and so forth. Uh, but then they found in order for the soap suds to work, they had to uh, fly real slow and low, and they were getting shot up. So uh, the C-130 Hercules loss in combat was 38, 21 in non-combat. And I'm surprised it wasn't more because there was a lot of them over there being used. The B-57 Canberra, United States Air Force. It's interesting looking plane. Uh, the deployment of actual combat capable B-57Bs to Benoit in August 1964 began with two aircraft lost and one damage and collision on arrival. An additional five aircraft were destroyed when another 15 damaged by a Viet Cong mortar attack in November of the same year. They about to wipe all the planes out before they even got in the air. Uh, the first combat mission was flown on 19 February 1965. The first excursion into North Vietnam took place on 2 March as part of Rolling Thunder. The aircraft typically carried nine 500-pound bombs in the bomb bay and four 750-pound bombs under the wings. In April, Canabaris began flying night intruder missions supported by United States Air Force's C-123 providers or C-130 Hercules flare ships and uh, U.S. Navy's EF-10B Sky, Sky Knights, electronic warfare aircraft. A U.S. B-57 cameras were primarily used for dive bombing and strafing with the early models mounting eight 50 caliber machine guns for four per wing. Later models mounted four 20 meter cannons, two per wing for strafing. Uh, these weapons combined with their bomb loads and four hours of flight time made them excellent ground support aircraft as well as exceptional truck killers along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. A pretty awesome firepower on that. Uh, again, not 38 in combat, 16 in non-combat. The RF-101 Voodoo, United States Air Force. In service, the RF-101C was nicknamed the Longbird. It was the only version of the Voodoo to see combat. And you can see there's a lot of, a lot of plane in front of the engine and so forth there. The F-101 lineage included several versions, low-altitude fighter bomber, photo reconnaissance, two-seat interceptor, and transition trainer. The first Voodoo, an F-101A fighter version, made its initial flight on September 29, 1954. I was 10 years old at that time. A development of the unarmed RF-101, the world's first supersonic photo reconnaissance aircraft, began in 1956, while 35 RF-101As and 166 RF-101Cs were produced. Some single and dual-seat Voodoo's were converted to the reconnaissance configuration and redesigned 
RF-101Bs and RF-101Gs and RF-101HS is later in their operational lives. I don't know how you could keep up with all the airplanes and their and the different changes they threw it to them. But um, the first one, the first supersonic, 33 in combat, six in non-combat. This T-28 Trojan. That looks like something during the uh, World War II fighting the Japanese there. The T-28 Trojan is a piston engine military trainer aircraft used by the United States Air Force and United States Navy beginning in the 1950s. Besides its use as a trainer, the T-28 was successfully employed as a counterinsurgency aircraft primarily during the Vietnam War. T-28s were supplied to the South Vietnamese Air Force in support of Arvin ground operations. Arvins would be the South Vietnamese uh, Army Republic of Vietnam. Seeing extensive service during the Vietnam War in uh, Vietnam uh, National Air Force hands, as well as the secret war in Laos. Did y'all know we had a secret war in Laos? Uh, a lot of people didn't, especially then. A T-28 Trojan was the first U.S. fixed-wing aircraft lost in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Captain Robert L. Simpson, United States Air Force Detachment 2A, 1st Air Command Group, and Lieutenant Hoa, South Vietnam National Air Force, were shot down by the ground fire on August 28, 1962, while flying close air support. Neither crewmen survived. The United States Air Force lost 23 T-28s to all causes during the war with the last two losses occurring in 1968. So 1962, when we were really not there, uh, we were flying uh, backup missions for, and with the South Vietnamese and uh, were shot down in 1962. Losses were 23. A-26 Invader. That's also a kind of a strange looking engine there. The first B-26 is to arrive in South East Asia in December 1960 were unmarked aircraft operating under the auspices of the USCIA. They were soon augmented by an additional 16 aircraft, 12 B-26Bs and B-26Cs plus four RB-26Cs. The mission of all these aircraft was to assist the Royal Lao government in fighting the Pathet Lao. The aircraft were subsequently operated in South Vietnam under Project Farmgate. The only other deployment of B-26 aircraft to Laos prior to the induction of the B-26K-A-26A was the deployment of two RB-26 aircraft specifically modified for night reconnaissance deployment to Laos between May and July of 1962 under Project Black Watch. So you can see they they got it when they come up with an airplane that's working um so forth then they uh, quite often rather than come up with a whole new airplane which is hard to believe because they got so many different ones they will modify them and give them a new name to just uh you know just all it does is reconnaissance work the aircraft from laos participated in the early phase of the vietnam war with the united states air force but with vietnamese markings as part of farm gate so the united states air force was flying them but if you're looking at them on the ground, it was a uh, Vietnamese mark. Though, though, uh, though Farmgate operated B-26Bs and B-26Cs and genuine RB-26Cs, many of these aircraft were operated on the design, designation RB-26C that we used in combat capacity. Okay, so That was one of them secret airplanes. Losses were 22 in combat. A-37 Dragonfire. That thing looks just like it's flying. I mean, just going fast, just sitting there like it is there. Of course, it is flying. In August 1967, 25 A-37As were sent to Vietnam under the Combat Dragon Evaluation Program and flew from Benoit Air Base on United States Air Force Air Commando missions, including close air support, helicopter escort, forward air control, FAC, and night interdiction. Combat loads including high explosive bombs, cluster munition dispensers, unguided rocket packs, napalm tanks, and SUU 11A minigun pod. For most missions, the aircraft also carried two additional external fuel tanks. 
Now, it's kind of funny over there today uh, when they were flying, they would eject those uh, extra, extra fuel tanks. And now the Vietnamese over there in Vietnam are using them today for uh, uh, like canoes uh, up and down the river. Uh, Benware Air Base uh, was uh, where I flew into. It was about 20 miles north of uh, Saigon. Uh, today, Benoit Air Base is still an air base. It's used by the communist uh, North Vietnamese um, Air Force. You can get within a couple miles of it, but that's about as close as you can get to Benoit Air Base today. A-37 Dragonfire lost 22 in combat. The C-123 provider. During the Vietnam War, some C-123s were modified for specialized roles such as the uses of C-123s as flare ships to eliminate targets for fixed-wing gunships such as the AC-47 and AC-119G. In other words, they would go be flying over and put out the uh, eject the uh, parachute flares that would look, come down slow and would light up so you can see what was going on. Would also light up for the gunships to come in. By 1962, the C-123K variant Aircraft was evaluated for operations in Southeast Asia, and their stellar performance led the Air Force to upgrade to the new C-123K standard, which featured auxiliary jet pods underneath the wings, so they would take the prop and, and make and make them jets. Okay, uh, let's see, I lost my place. And jet pods underneath the wings and anti-skid brakes. I guess that was important. In 1968, the aircraft helped resupply troops at Quezon in Vietnam during the 77-day day, uh, day siege by North Vietnam. A number of C-123s were configured as VIP transports, including General William Westmoreland's uh, one that was what we call the White Well. Uh, the C-123 also gained notoriety for its use in Operation Ranch Hand defoliant operation in Vietnam. That's where they uh, sprayed Agent Orange, Blue, Pink, and all those. Um, during the Battle of Quezon, uh, there were, uh, I know at least one shot down. I think there was a couple. So they would fly over the um, uh, runway there at Quezon, and they would uh, eject out of the back the parachute with the supplies and so forth and keep right on going. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even slow down. They just, uh, and it would slide down, and the soldier could go out and get it. Uh, the C-123 provider lost 21 in combat. 32 in non-combat, okay? They lost more to com uh, to non-combat than they did to uh, uh, combat there. The C-47 Skytrain, I'm certain that uh, they didn't look that pretty when they were being used. I'm certain they were camouflaged and so forth, but I don't remember ever seeing one. If I did, I didn't know what I was seeing. The Douglas C-47 Skytrain, or Dakota, is a military transport aircraft developed from the civilian Douglas DC-3 airline. It was used extensively by the Allies during World War II. Sir, several C-47 variations were used in the Vietnam War by the United States Air Force, including those advanced electronic warfare variations, which sometimes were called electric goonies. Miami International Airport was a United States Air Force military depot used to convert the commercial DC-3s, uh, C-47, to military use. So right there at the um, uh, Miami International Airport, they had a section that took the, uh, uh, I guess, they used DC-3s and turned them into a combat. They came in as commercial aircraft purchased from Third World Airlines and were completely stripped, rebuilt, and reconditioned. Long-range fuel tanks were installed along with upgrade avionics and gun mounts. The left is a first-rate military aircraft headed for combat in Vietnam in a variety of missions. E-47s were also operated by the Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian Air Force. A gunship variation using three 7.62mm miniguns designated AC-47 Spooky, often nicknamed Puff, the Magic Dragon, also was deployed. And that was an awesome airplane, and we're going to be talking a bit, a bit more about the AC-47 uh, uh, Spooky in, in a minute. So, The R-85 Vigilante. The North American A-5 Vigilante was an American carrier-based supersonic bomber designed and built by North American Aviation for the United States Navy. 
It set several world records, including the long and distance speed and altitude records. Eight squadrons of RA-5C vigilantes also saw extensive service in Vietnam starting in August of 1964, carrying out hazardous medium-level reconnaissance missions. Although proven fast and agile, 18 RA-5Cs were lost in combat, 14 to any aircraft fire, three to serviced air missiles, and one to a MiG-21 during Operation Linebacker Two. Nine more were lost in operational accidents. So the losses of the RA-5 vigilante was 18 in combat and nine in, uh, and, and nine in non-combat. The B-52 Stratofors. You cannot believe just how big that plane is unless you walk, on, walk up to it on ground. It, it's, it's enormous. During the war, 10 B-52s were shot down over North Vietnam. Of the losses, now this was where it gets crazy because I got this right out, right out of the, 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 the book here. Uh, during the war, 10 B-52s were shot down over North Vietnam. Of the losses, 17 were shot down in combat operations. That is, uh, that now there are 10 over North Vietnam, but it was 17 I lost altogether, what it's trying to say. One was a write off because of combat damage. In other words, it was shot up so much you couldn't get, there was no way they were going to fix it. 11 crashed by accidents. One decommissioned because of combat damage and one burned at the airport. However, some of the crashed in flight accidents crashed due to missiles or anti aircraft guns. 11 crashed by accidents, one decommissioned, and one caught on fire. That's a lot of money to sit there and burn. In March 1965, the United States commenced Operation Rolling Thunder. The first combat mission, Operation Arc Light, was flown by B 52Fs on 18th of July 1965, when 30 bombers struck a communist stronghold near the Ben Cat district in South Vietnam. A little more than 50% of the bombs fell within the target zone. The force returned to the Anderson Air Force Base, except for one bomber, which electronic problems that recovered to Clark Air Force, recovered to Clark Air Force Base. The mission having lasted 13 hours, post-strike assessments by teams of South Vietnamese troops where American advisors found evidence that the Viet Cong had departed from the area before the raid, and it was suspected that, that infiltration of the South's forces may have tipped off the North, uh, North because of the South Vietnamese Army troops involved in the post-strike inspection. So basically, they flew from here all the way over there, 13 hours. That's a long time in an airplane, I know, because that's what, about what it takes one leg now going uh, to Vietnam. And uh, they were Viet Cong were told before that we got there that, that we were coming, so they uh, uh, did they did him out. In other words, they left. Uh, losses were 17 in combat, 14 in non-combat. Okay, let's get all this one right. This one's the E R B 66 United States Air Force destroyer. This was a non-production aircraft. This was, in other words, this didn't go down the assembly line. This was a specially built airplane. The RB-66A cost per aircraft was $15.5 million. Now, that's in 1960s. Now, tell them what it would be today. I think we're probably talking about close to a billion. 14550 uh, The airframe was $14,547,896. Uh, the engine installed, I would hope it would be installed, was only $719,500. The electronics was $122,215. That's an expensive radio. Ordnance, $1,557. Armament and others, $125,043. The RB-66C was a specialized electronic reconnaissance aircraft with an expanded crew of seven including additional electronics warfare experts. The RB-66C aircraft had distinctive wingtip pods and were used in the vicinity of Cuba during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and later over Vietnam. Unarmed, EB-66B, EB-66C, 
and AB-66E aircraft flew numerous missions during the Vietnam War. They not only helped gather electronic intelligence about the North Vietnamese defenses, but also provided protection for the daily bombing missions of the F-105s by jamming North Vietnamese radar systems. Early on, B-66 flew oval racetrack patterns over North Vietnam, but after one of the aircraft was shot down by MiG, the vulnerable B-66 flights were ordered back just outside of North Vietnam. Losses were 14. Now, I've got to go back and do some research on this plane. I believe if you ever saw the movie Bat-21, where Colonel Hamilton was, uh, was shot down, the plane was shot down. I believe this was the plane he was flying uh, when he was shot down because it was, electronic, it was a special electronic reconnaissance plane when he was uh, done. So I uh, highly recommend you go back and see Lessons of Vietnam, Bat 21 show. I uh, think you'll enjoy here, seeing it. It was the original, real, what really happened, and the movie was good, but it's not anywhere near. Uh, the loss was 14. Ah, there it is, the AC, A40, AC-47 Spooky. This plane was awesome. Awesome. Also called Puff the Magic Dragon. The AC-47 was a United States Air Force C-47, the military version of the DC-3 that we already talked about, that had been modified by mounting three 7.62 General Electric miniguns to fire through two rear windows openings and the side cargo door, all on the left, the pilot side of the aircraft, to provide close air support for ground troops. The guns were actuated by a control of the pilot's yoke, whereby he could control the guns either individually or together, although gunners were also among the crew to assist with gun failure and similar issues. It was primarily, much primarily run by the pilot. The AC-47 could orbit the target for hours, providing suppressive fire over an elliptical area approximately 52 yards in diameter, placing around every 2.4 yards during a three-second burst. Now, you might want to come back and listen to that one again. In a 57-yard in diameter, placing around every 2.4 yards in a three-second burst. One, two, three. That's a lot of bullets. The aircraft also carried flares it could drop to eliminate the battleground. The losses were 12, 12 in combat and seven in non-combat. Man, you had to be a tough bad guy to stand on the ground and shoot back at that guy when he's shooting like that at you. But that's the AC-47 Puff the Magic Dragon. The OV-10 Bronco. The OV-10 served in the United States Air Force, the United States Marine Corps, and the United States uh, and the U.S. Uh, total of the a to and the and U.S. A total of 81 OV-10 Bron Broncos were ultimately lost during the Vietnam War, with Air Force losing 64, the Navy 7, and the Marines 10. Racked armament in the Vietnam War was usually seven-shot, 2.75, inch rocket pods with white phosphorus marker rounds or high explosive rockets or five inch four shot rocket pods bombs air delivery para dropped it dropped the bombs using a parachute unattended seismic sensors which we've talked about before on the show uh, battlefield elimination flares and other stores were carried as well operational experiences showed that there were some weaknesses in the ov-10's design it is seriously underpowered this contributed to crashes in Vietnam and sloping terrain because the pilots could not climb fast enough. While specifications state that the aircraft could reach 26,000 feet in Vietnam, the aircraft could only reach 18,000 feet. No AV-1, 10 pilots survived ditching the aircraft. Uh, you could be flying along and all of a sudden you get up into the uh, Central Highlands and uh, it was too high for you to make that climb up after you were shooting and so forth. And, F-104 Starfighter. The Lockheed F-104 Starfighter is a single-engine, high-performance supersonic interceptor aircraft originally developed for the United States Air Force. Commencing with the Operation Rolling Thunder campaign, the Starfighter was used both in the air superiority role and in the air support missions, although it saw little aerial combat and scored no air-to-air -air kills. Starfighters were successful in deterring M uh, MiG interceptors, 
Starfighter squadrons made two deployments to Vietnam, the first being from April 1965 to November 1965, flying, flying 2,937 combat sorties. Starfighters returned to Vietnam when the 435th Tactical Fighter Squadron deployed from, from June 1966 until July of 1967, in which time they flew a total a further 2,269 hours in combat. So basically they flew over 5,000 hours in combat. Uh, sorties were a total, uh, total of 5,206 uh, sorties. They lost nine to combat and five to non-combat. The C-7 Caribou, this was another uh, very popular plane. The Caribou served their purpose well as a tactical transport during the Vietnam War, where in larger cargo aircraft such as the Fairchild C-120 provider and the Lockheed C-130 Hercules could not land on the shorter landing strips. The aircraft could carry 30 troops or two Jeeps or, one, or, or similar light vehicles. The rear loading ramp could also be used for parachute dropping. Now, in other words, the 30 troops could, could jump out in parachutes, or they could uh, take the parachutes and send out ammunition or supplies or whatever it needed to be, sea uh, rations and so forth, out the back. Under the Johnson-McConnell Agreement of 1966, the Army relinquished the fixed-wing caribou to the United States Air Force in exchange for an end to restrictions on Army rotary wing operations. That was in 1966. Uh, there have been all kinds of restrictions on the uh, uh, the uh, rotary wings or helicopters, and at that time they switched all the uh, <coughs> fixed wings uh, over to the uh, Air Force. The AC-1 designation was changed in 1962 to CV-2 and then C-7 when the United States Army C-2s were transferred to the United States Air Force in 1967, U.S. and Australian caribou saw extensive service during the Vietnam War. Some U.S. caribou were captured by North Vietnamese forces and remained in service with that country throughout the late 1970s following the Vietnam War. Losses were Air Force 9 in combat and 10 in non-combat. F-102 Delta Dagger. Okay. The Convair F-102 Delta Dagger was an American interceptor aircraft entering service in 1956. Its main purpose was to intercept invading Soviet strategic bomber fleets during the Cold War. The F-102 served in the Vietnam War flying fighter patrols and serving as bomber escorts a total of 14 aircraft were lost in Vietnam, one to air-to-air uh, -to -air combat, several to ground fire, and the remaining to accidents. In 1962, after radar contacts det detected by ground radar were thought to possibly be North Vietnamese uh, 228 Beagle bombers, the F-102s were sent to other co nearby countries to intercept these aircraft as they threatened South Vietnam. So. That was actually before we got into the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, later, Boeing B-52 Stratoforces strikes, codenamed Arc Lights, were escorted by F-102s based in the theater. That means in the, in the area of South Vietnam. It was during one of these missions that an F-102 was shot down by a North Vietnamese MiG using an AA-2 Atoll heat-seeking missile. This was the only air-to-air -air loss for the F-102 during the Vietnam War. Losses in combat, seven. Non-combat, seven. The, the F-111 Aardvark, United States Air Force. The plane's kind of strange as the word, Aardvark. Oh, I guess that long nose. Uh, the designers of the F-111 faced a challenge. They needed a plane that could fly at very high speeds but still take off or land on short runways. F-111 design adopted the new technology of variable geometry or swing wings. Now, if you can't, if you notice just where the wing goes into the uh, uh, fuselage there, uh, basically the wing moves. Uh, the F-111 designs adopted a new technology of uh, variable geometry of swing wings. These permitted the wings to swing out during takeoff to generate maximum lift, and they would tuck inward mid-flight to achieve higher speeds. 
the, by moving them around, they could adjust the lift. The F 111s didn't have a great debut, the bit in, yeah, that's what I, that's what I was trying to say. Uh, in combat, after the detachment of six F 111s were deployed to Vietnam in 1968, three of them crashed in 55 missions. All of them accidents linked to defective wing stabilizers. In other words, those fancy wings didn't always stay where they were supposed to be. The F 111s were withdrawn and the flaw was corrected. It cost just $100 million to fix the wings. In the linebacker raids of 1972, the F Aardvark finally demonstrated its potential, skimming beneath North Vietnam extensive radar night work. Network at night, the F 111s blasted North Vietnamese airfields and air fence batteries, weakening the resistance up to incoming B 52s. Lost six in combat, five in non combat. The OQU 22 Pave Eagle. Uh, again, that looks just like any old just plane you see out at the airport, wouldn't it? Uh, a small unit. The QU-22 was a Beach 36A36 Bonanza modified during the Vietnam War to be an electronic monitoring signal relay aircraft developed under the project name Pave Eagle for the United States Air Force. These aircraft were intended to be used as unmanned drones to monitor seismic and acoustic sensors dropped along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos and report troops and supply movements. In past shows, we have talked about uh, these uh, these uh, sensors they would we drop that sound, look like monkey crap or bear or uh, 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 lion crap uh, along the road so they could uh, pass and Ho Chi Minh Trail so they could smell the urine and so forth or actually the sound too depending on which ones that we use uh, or drop along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos to report troop and supply movements when the project was put into operation in 1968 however the aircraft were all flown by pilots they were not flown flown as drones uh, and remote control. They were flown by pilots. Losses of the Q20, QU-22 Pave Eagle, seven in combat and one in non-combat. AC Spectre, United States Air Force, another awesome ship. AC-130 gunship was a heavily armed, long endurance, ground attack variant of the C-130 Hercules transport. Fixed wing aircraft. It carried a wide array of ground attack weapons that are integrated with sophisticated sensors, navigation, and fire control systems. Unlike other modern military fixed wing aircraft, the AC 130 relies on visual targeting. Because its large profile and low operating altitudes of approximately 7,000 feet make it an easy target, its close air support missions were usually flown at night. AC-130 gunship first arrived in South Vietnam on 21 September 1967 and began combat operations over Laos and South Vietnam that year. In June 1968, AC-130s were deployed to Tonsonut Air Base near Saigon for support against the Tet Offensive. Now, I love this where it says uh, Tonsonut near Saigon, it, and now it's in the middle of Saigon almost. Uh, by December 1968, most AC 130s flew under F 4 Phantom II escort to protect the gunship against heavy and concentrated anti aircraft fire, normally three Phantoms per gunship, which may be why so many Phantoms got shot down. They said, Shoot me instead of the gunship. On 24th of May 1969, the first Spectre gunship was lost to enemy fire. So they made it two years before they were shot down. Losses in combat was six. The EF-10 Sky Knight. It's amazing how many different planes we had, and each one of them just almost had a, a, a specific thing that we used for. AF-10 Sky Knight, United States Marine Corps. The Sky Knight was the only Korean war jet fighter that also flew in Vietnam. The EF-10Bs were served in the electronic warfare, warfare role during the Vietnam War until 1969. No more than 10 EF-10Bs were in Vietnam at one time. The electronic warfare Sky Knight was a valuable electronic countermeasure asset to jam the surface-to-air missiles and tracking and guidance systems. One main history 
when its EF-10Bs were conducting the first United States Marine Corps airborne radar jamming mission on 29 April 1965 to support a United States Air Force strike mission. Four EF-10Bs also supported a massive strike of the SA-2 SAM sites near Hanoi on 27 July 1965. In other words, their job was to go in and jam the radar so the radar for the SAM missiles uh, couldn't find the, uh, the bombers, uh, which means that they didn't do a good job. They got hit first themselves. Many U.S. aircraft were lost to SA surface-to-air missiles in Vietnam, and the electronic attack on the SA associated radar system was known as fogbound mission. The F-3D also dropped chaff over the radar sites. The first EF 10B lost in Vietnam was to a SAM uh, on 18th of March 1966, while four more EF 10Bs were lost in Vietnam to accidents and unknown crises. When I said chaff, that's kind of like tinfoil they throw out the airplane that, that affects the uh, missiles and it follows that. Um, so losses were five. S2 tracker. Now that's also weird. Also looking little airplanes. Looks like it's kind of. Uh, uh, reminds me of a little guppy. The S-2 Tracker Navy, the government's S-2 Tracker was a single airframe anti-submarine warfare aircraft to enter service with the United States Navy. The Tracker was of conventional design, propeller-driven with twin radical radial engines, a high wing that could be folded for storage on aircraft carriers, and a tricycle undercarriage, Okay, which means it had the the, the small wheels. Tracker served their careers as Cold War weapons, keeping Soviet submarines at a distance, uh, though some patrol waters for surface vessels off the coast of Vietnam during the Vietnam War. The only combat loss of a tracker occurred during the Vietnam War. Three in combat and two in non-combat. I don't think they found too many submarines with the North Vietnamese, but uh, I would say that China and Russia had them out there. A-3 Sky Warrior. A-3 Sky Warrior initially used in the nuclear armed strategic bomber role, the emergence of effective ballistics missiles led to this mission being deprioritized by the early 1960s. Throughout the majority of its later service life, the A Sky Raider was tasked with various secondary missions, which included use as an electronic warfare platform, tactical reconnaissance aircraft, and high-capacity air refueling tanker. It was also the longest-serving carrier-based aircraft in history, having entered service during the 1950s. Throughout its service, the Sky Warrior was the heaviest operational aircraft to operate from an aircraft carrier, which contributed to its nickname of Well. Sky Warriors saw some, of the, some use in the conventional bombing and mine-laying role during the Vietnam War. The A-3 served as a tanker, Photographic reconnaissance, electronic reconnaissance, and electronic warfare roles. I was hoping to get through with all the fixed wings, but don't know whether I'm going to make it or not. The A3 Sky Warrior lost two in combat and five in non-combat. Ah, yes, the H-16 Albatross. The Grumman HU-16 Albatross is a large twin radial engine amphibious flying boat that was used by the United States Air Force, United States Navy, and the United States Coast Guard primarily as a search and rescue and combat search and rescue aircraft. HU-16B long wing variant. Albatross was used by the United States Air Force Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Service and saw extensive combat service during the Vietnam War. The United States Navy also employed the HU-16CD Albatross as a search and rescue aircraft from coastal naval air stations, both stateside and overseas. It was also employed as an operational support aircraft. And I'm going to stop here because I, I don't want you to uh, get uh, short change into the others, but we're getting uh, pretty close to getting into the um, uh, helicopters and, and some of the other stuff we're going to be. But that's the HU-16 Avatross. Uh, the next show will be March 25th. Uh, with you know, out there, guys, with all the things being canceled and so forth because of the virus, this is a great time to sit down and watch some of the past shows in uh, on demand, uh, the Lessons of Vietnam shows. So 
uh, when you were going out, when you were going to the uh, ACC tournaments uh, and you can't go because they, uh, they're not going to let you in, uh, it's a good time to sit down and watch one of the shows or whatever. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to know exactly what to do about this virus. You got one that's going to die tomorrow and then others saying, don't worry about it and uh, so forth. But unfortunately, Wake County has about 17 right now uh, 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 people with the virus. All came from someplace else. None of them call it here. They all came from someplace else. But, uh, you know, there, there's some strange people out there. Uh, one of the strangest things right now is I, have, I understand there's a shortage of toilet paper. Uh, you know, I can understand the mask, even though they don't do any good. Uh, but clinics-type tissue, maybe I understand. But toilet paper? Why is there a shortage of toilet paper? I don't know. Y'all did research and call me and let me know. Uh, but, you know, people are not eating in Chinese restaurants. And the strangest thing is they're not buying Corona beer. What's Corona beer got to do with the coronavirus? There's some strange thinking people out there. Be safe. And if you think you may have the virus, stay home and watch some lessons of Vietnam. Good night. And we'll see you on the 25th of March. Thank you. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.